Hello. In my series on A Beginner's Guide to Building Better Worlds, today I'll be talking about Chapter 2. Now, Chapter 2 gives us a brief history of the Zapatista movement and also an explanation of Zapatismo itself as a way of praxis and as a way of thinking the world. So let's explore chapter two. Now the Zapatistas burst onto the international stage on January 1, 1994, the day NAFTA went into effect. And you could see them on every TV screen and news coverage because it was something spectacular. They primarily concentrated on the town of San Cristobal, Las Casas, but they also captured other towns in the Mexican state of Chiapas. But according to the authors, that is not when the movement actually starts, but that's when Zapatistas, in a way, introduce themselves to the whole world. Now, according to the authors, the beginning of what becomes the Zapatista movement can be traced back to 1983, when three native and three mestizo males, urban, go to the Chiapas, go to the mountains, to launch a guerrilla movement. Obviously, we can surmise from this that these men thought that they could go and teach revolutionary tactics and practice to the native Maya people. But to their surprise, they themselves learn from the native people. And thus develops a relationship. I mean, the most prominent face of those intellectuals, of course, is Subcomandante Marcos. But the relationship develops in which the native people infuse the struggle with their own philosophies. This is what I see as a sort of what Deleuze imagines as a movement that is not centered at one place. Or also in Gramscian sense, the role of the organic intellectual, right, who goes and lives with the people. We can also trace some kind of Freudian understanding of this relationship, you know, where the so-called experts, intellectuals, go to the people and let the people teach them. But overall, the Zapatista movement is led by the native people. Their histories and cosmologies, and then these urban intellectuals who join them, along with the people, develop a mode of thinking and a mode of resistance to the neoliberal order. That's the sense you get in this introductory part. Now, please bear in mind that the authors of already informed us that they are not going to give us a clinical study of the Zapatista movement, nor are they going to give us an exhaustive history of the Zapatista movement, because there are plenty of materials available for that. But the project of this book is to learn from the Zapatista movement, to share with their permission what they have allowed the authors to share but to use the Zapatista movement as a loose diagram, so to speak, to develop our own modes of thinking and practice in the 21st century, wherever we are. So please keep that in mind. Now, the authors give us three phases of the Zapatista movement. Phase one was launched on January 1, 1994, when the Zapatista Army, EZLN, marches into 
the city is in Chiapas. That phase lasts only 12 days. The Mexican army is mobilized against the Zapatistas and hundreds of people die in the process. But there was something peculiar about the Zapatistas when they come to the cities like San Cristobal. And you can see that response even in the 60-minute documentary that was done immediately after the events happened. And some of the government representatives will tell you that they could see that these were not some form of fundamentalist rebels. They had principles and they had genuine demands. So in that first phase, what do the Zapatistas do? They confiscate the government records, especially land records, and destroy them because that is one mode of oppression used against the Maya people, giving lands to large landholders. But they do another thing that is absolutely genius. As they are capturing the city, they send a contingent to the local parish priest, to the Catholic priest, and request him that the Zapatista army would like the archbishop, the Catholic archbishop, to mediate between them and the government, and that the church should request the government not to bomb San Cristobal. Now that isn't just a brilliant strategy, it also shows that these guerrillas aren't only willing to fight, they also know how power works. What symbolic weight does the Catholic Church hold in Mexico? But also that the aim of every fight isn't just to continue destroying things, it is to reach the negotiation table, right? Classic von Clausewitz, right? The aim of a war is to bring your enemy to a favor favorable negotiating situation. Then the church mediates and accords are signed, which are called the San Andres Accords, which the Zapatistas have respected, but the Mexican government has not fully implemented. But those 12 days can be considered the first phase of the Zapatista movement. Now phase two starts when the government of Mexico does not implement the accords. And that is considered a rupture from the government and creation of autonomous Zapatista territory. These are loosely the territories in Chiapas that either the Zapatistas hold or have their own affiliated communities. One of the maps gives us roughly a porous boundary of the Zapatista territory and the other map shows us the current municipalities of the Zapatista movement that are run and governed by the local councils. Now phase three is still continuing and it involves developing relationships with the progressive part of Mexican society but also internationalizing the Zapatista movement and their concerns. Now the two stages, phase two and phase three according to the authors but also various other scholars, they overlap. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that this is a native-led movement. What are some things peculiar about it is the gender equality, that the communities are friendly to gender identities, that there are no classes, no private ownership, collectivism, and a focus on building and strengthening their communities against the aggression of the Mexican state, but also the private armies, the paramilitaries. Roughly speaking, 
the Zapatista territory is governed by the people and each area has its own self-government which is rotated and people elect their own leaders and people replace them and no single leader speaks for the entire people. The decisions are made collectively. So overall then, the territories that I just shared with you are the territories that are governed by the Zapatistas, but they are governed democratically by the people themselves. Actually, if you look at the sign to the entrance of the Zapatista territory, it declares pretty clearly that you are entering the Zapatista territory. Here, the people rule and government obeys. Then on page 21, we have La Sexta, the sixth declaration which is intimately connected to the Zapatista mission of internationalizing their reach and reaching audiences beyond the Mexican border, not to teach them, but to learn from them. What is the declaration? It says, to fight along with everyone who was humble and simple like ourselves, who was in great need and who suffered from exploitation and thievery by the rich and their bad government here in our Mexico and in other countries in the world. And so based on this, the Zapatistas have launched since 2021 the Journey for Life, where the native contingent, mostly women, are traveling to various parts of the world one of the groups actually is, is in Europe, I think, right now, to bring their message to the world, but more importantly, to see how, they, how the world does its things and to learn. So remember, Zapatistas will never assert or tell you that this is how you do things. They will share what they do and how they do it but they are also there to learn from any other resistance movement, any other culture. So this covers roughly the three phases of the Zapatista movement. The beginning of the fight, the 12 days fight. The second stage where the Zapatistas withdrew from a con confrontation with the government and started building their own communities and then overlapping phase three where they now trying to build alliances with the general progressive Mexican population but also the rest of the population of the world. Now on a side note it's important to note that even though the Mexican government has not launched a massive campaign against the Zapatistas. There have been fights, there have been intrusions into the Zapatista territory, and Zapatistas also face violence from the paramilitaries which are owned by wealthy people or wealthy landowners. Government also uses coercive measures, but also measures to buy out the native people by giving them grants and compensations. But the Zapatista response to that is not of revenge, but rather, these are our brothers and sisters. They have been forced to do this, but we still claim them as our own. And that's also where the Zapatistas are different from any other guerrilla movement. Because of this approach, where they still see their brothers and sisters were taking money from the government, not as their enemies, but rather people who might have been corrupted or coerced by a corrupt system. So they can look at power structurally and what it does to people. So there are 13 original demands that the Zapatistas had made, and these are also the things that guide their communities. And these 13 demands were land, housing, work, 
food, health, education, information, culture, independence, democracy, justice, liberty, and peace. And these are the principles that guide the Zapatista movement. Now, the second part of this chapter teaches us about Zapatismo, the spirit of the Zapatistas, something that we can learn from and maybe adapt to our own situations wherever we are to be Zapatistas wherever we are. The section on Zapatismo is really crucial for all of us to understand and to learn from. And the core principle, of course, is everything for everyone, nothing for ourselves, which to me is one of the most revolutionary ideas, if you think about it. That if we think the word, not in terms of what we want from it, but what's in it for others, it completely changes our whole worldview. Now, the term Zapatismo, of course, is derived from the famous revolutionary of the Mexican Revolution, Emiliano Zapata. But Zapatismo is an homage to Zapata, but also thinking and working in the world through the cosmologies and the vision of the Maya people who are the native people of the Zapatista movement. So it's a combination of an ideological figure or of an ideal revolutionary figure and practices and belief systems of the Maya culture itself, combining them together to constitute what is loosely termed the Zapatismo. Now, how do the authors define the term Zapatismo? They define Zapatismo as the diverse, unique, and dynamic ensemble of relational practices, principles, and core values the Zapatistas engender and share, which serve to recognize the dignity and interdependence of all, welcoming a plurality of responses to injustices of all forms. Okay, so what is clearly evident in this definition that it is a relational understanding of the world which acknowledges what kind of injustices exist in the world and then how to address them not from just an individual perspective but from the perspective of all those whose lives are being impacted. Now, here are some of the principles of Zapatismo which the Zapatistas obviously practice and which we can talk about a little more. To be honest, I'm not going to read the Spanish part because I don't know Spanish and I do not want to be disrespectful and pronounce it, you know, in a terrible accent that I might have, right? So I will only read the English part of these principles. To obey, not command. To propose, not impose. To represent, not supplant. To convince, not conquer. To construct, not destroy. To serve, not to serve oneself. To work from below, not seek to rise. So these are the seven principles of Zapatismo and our authors do discuss some of them. Let's go and see how do they discuss some of these principles under emancipatory politics and the actual existing democracy of the Zapatista movement. So the authors see Zapatismo as a combination of Maya way of thinking the world, the Maya cosmologies, some aspects of liberation theology, 
that also are infused with practices for women's rights, for gender identities, and generally speaking, a socialistic way of looking at the world. So it's a combination of all the philosophies that can create a space or a time in which what Freire would call it is full realization of human potential in a collectivity is possible. That's why, according to the authors, the Zapatistas have abolished any form of political parties. Individual ownership is discouraged and instead the property, the land is owned collectively, worked collectively, and the bounty is shared collectively amongst the community. There is no elite class because the leaders are chosen in a way that they are replaced. And so that makes sure that no hierarchy of class is created within the com community. So overall, what we learn then is that here are our people who have combined the knowledge of their own native cultures with some knowledge that comes from a progressive branch of Catholic Church, so to speak, you know, the liberation theologist, and some socialistic principles to create actually existing communities which are anti-capitalist, not about accumulation of wealth or accumulation of power, which are fair to all genders and sexualities and which are not racist. And then with these principles, they have created actual communities that exist and thrive despite the pressures against them from the Mexican government and the paramilitaries. And that, I think, is the miracle of the Zapatista movement. But at no stage any single person can make a decision. The decisions are all made collectively after the community has communicated with each other. They are not top down. And I think that's why we can see what the Zapatistas have done and what they continue to do because they are constantly reevaluating and reshaping their practices, right? Is to teach us that revolution can never be just driven by one fixed ideology and by an elite. That revolutionary change will be constant and we will learn in the process. But it cannot be a practice which is oppressive in nature and which dictates to the people what they need to do. That is one important lesson that I draw from this chapter. So in the last section of the chapter, the authors give us their understanding of a few ethical principles of the Zapatista movement. The first one is asking we walk. Now what does it mean? I mean what the authors explain to us is that it means that someone has the conviction to walk the path that they talk about, but also that the Zapatistas are sure that while they are struggling for something, their understanding of the struggle may not be absolute. It's not ashed in stone. So as they struggle, they are open to change and open to learning. Now, that is really a brilliant way of looking at any struggle. Because most of the times, if, if a struggle is deeply ideological, that ideology in a way will predetermine our actions and will not leave much room for change while we are struggling. But asking we walk basically means that we struggle, but in the process of doing that, we are open to learning. We have the humility to maybe alter our strategies after we have collectively thought about it. Another ethical principle that the authors discuss towards the end of the book is everything for everyone, nothing for us. So 
I think the meaning is pretty clear, but when everything is for everyone in the community, within the Zapatista community or within the global community, that rewrites our brains. I mean, think of our life in the Western world, but elsewhere too, wherever capitalism exists. We start with self, everything for me, right? And we become these subjects who constantly must arrogate to themselves whatever resources they can purchase or capture. But if we could reframe our way of looking at the world, everything for everyone and nothing for us, that writes then a kind of politics which is grounded in community and not in the self. So that's why in the Zapatista communities, obviously, resources are shared. Leaders don't own property. No one actually individually owns property because everything belongs to the community. And that means that my self-interest is connected to the community. If I'm going to protect the fields, if I'm going to protect the hospital, the nursery, my own self-interest is connected to the people and hence it is protected itself because it's not separate. It's not sundered from the community. Something that capitalism did and still does is sunder us from the larger communities so that we can become dependent human subjects who have to subsist on the crumbs that are thrown at us from the corporations and from the wealthy. The next ethical principle that the authors talk about towards the end of chapter 2 is, is to lead by obeying. Now, if we think of leadership and leading, what comes to mind is a centralized hierarchical order where the leader gives the orders and the led follow. To lead by obeying then reverses that. Who do we obey? We obey the voice of the people. So the leaders then are appointed by the people, but they don't shout orders at the people. They obey the social order constructed by the community, right? So if we lead by obeying the principles of the community or the consensus of the community. So as a result then, the leadership roles in the Zapatista community are never permanent. They are rotated. So that means no one person or a group or a family can become part of the elite. And since nobody owns individual property, so they can also not build their empires or, you know, whatever you, we do in the capitalistic society, political empires, financial empires. So to lead by obeying the community. That's another principle that the authors talk about towards the end of chapter two. And the last one is slowly but advancing, which I think is sort of something that every revolutionary movement or group should internalize. Because the world in which we live, we want fast results. But what the Zapatistas teach us is that it's the slow movement fortifying your communities, learning new things, changing your own practices, but consistent, slow work of building an alternative to the current order is what is important for advancing forward and not just rushing in that instrumental logic, right, where we are driven by results. The journey itself, slowly, methodically, must be accomplished with reflection, change, community, and collaboration. So slowly, but advancing. Being slow in achieving our goals doesn't necessarily mean 
that we have failed. Now, all of these principles that the authors talk about towards the end of chapter two, think about it. They are geared towards building community, sustaining a community, but each one of these principles is important in ridding our minds of the way we think within a capitalistic world. We think in terms of self-interest. We think in terms of quick profits. We think in terms of having a political system. We think in terms of reaching our goals within a quarter, within a month, all of these fast-paced activities. So these principles cut across that. So if we were to internalize some of these ideas and modify them for our own individual worldview, but collective work. My understanding from this chapter is that then the Zapatistas give us a workable, work in progress, but workable praxis of developing a mode of life superior to the current neoliberal model superior to what is being sold to us as the ultimate mode of existence of property ownership, fast-paced profits, exploitation as natural. So after I read this brief chapter and thought over these few principles that the authors discussed, obviously I learned a lot and I reflected on my own practices, but what stands out to me is that this, if we could emulate it within the context of our own lives collectively, wherever we are, be Zapatistas, wherever we are, we are not just resisting for resistance's sake, right? We are literally developing a mode of thinking and practice which has at its core the values shaped by the Maya knowledge, by the liberation theology, by the socialistic thinking, and by a kind of life-loving, humanistic thinking about the world, about the planet. A praxis that can be a viable praxis against the neoliberal political and economic order, which is being offered to us as one and the only system. So that's what I gain from this chapter. So to sum up, in this chapter, in the beginning, we get a brief history of the Zapatista movement. We learn about its core principles, the three phases of the Zapatista movement. And then towards the end of the chapter, the authors introduce us to a few core principles of Zapatismo that the Zapatistas themselves practice, but that could be useful to all of us if we understood them and adapted them to our own situation wherever we are in the world. That's all I have about chapter two. I'll be back with my conversation about the next chapter. Until then, if you have any questions, any suggestions, or if you want to point out something that I missed in my conversation, please add it in the comments. As always, I'm grateful for your presence in my life. Please stay safe, take care of each other, and I will now see you next time. Until then, peace and love.